Welcome to episode 77 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. <laughs> you always get me with her. Oh my God. <laughs> Uncle Mary. <laughs> Jesus. You're going to have to take your talk in there for the recording. <laughs> Welcome to episode 77 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. Tonight, I am joined by the most awesome Civil War ner nerd I know and the guy who has put up with my Tuesday moods, especially when we record late on a Wednesday evening, Darren Weeks. I am merely his crazy Canadian co-host, Mary. Uh -huh. okay. And my alter, oh. ego, my alter ego, Funko Mary, apparently lives with him in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And you almost said almost those, all those words, right? So yeah, so if this is uh, one of the later nights you've done this. Very exciting. Is, so how are yeah. you? What's, what's going on with you? I'm all right. Um, you know, I think we're finally into, uh, obviously we're now into March, getting well into March, which is nice. So spring is here. I've been hearing the robins in the morning, which is nice. It's a little bit more daylight. How about oh, you? Yeah. What are you up to? Well, it rains every day. It's cold. It's I know. Gloomy. I hear it's, about it. I it's hear it's about New it. England in spring. So we are I'm, getting there. So it's yes. okay, though. It's, it could be worse. It could be snow. It could be, I'll be bitching about the heat soon. Don't you worry you about that. Yeah. Um, if you're not so bitching one, about a hoodie that you don't have, you should be bitching about the weather, right? Okay. Well, all right then. Um, that hoodie is now safely tucked in my closet. <laughs> but in any case, so what's when we going go to on Chickamauga, you? are you going to make sure you buy a hoodie? I don't know. I don't even know. Maybe I'll just not get one just to complain. Maybe I'll do that. We'll see what happens. So probably. I will buy that hoodie just so I don't have to listen to that. <sighs> Great. Yeah. Anyway, as fantastic. being as I am hosting tonight and um, doing about as um, train wreck of a job as what we witnessed in the general movie we watched a couple of weeks ago with Buster Keaton, which uh -huh. is amazing. Um, By the way, it's not Michael Keaton. It's Buster Keaton. You had that I just said too. Buster. No, but you told everybody you said it was Michael Keaton. I said, no, it's Buster Keaton. You said Michael Keaton. Batman guy. I did not say that. Okay. You, you, you lie to you, you lie, you're only hurting yourself. Anyway, go, go, go on, go on. Oh my God. This is, yeah. Anyway, so, so sir, what are you drinking tonight? Sir, what happened to governor? What happened to that? Anyway. Oh, right, right, right. Let me correct myself. Sorry. Well, we'll delete that. So, we'll just, okay. we'll just edit that we'll just one. Edit out. that one out. Okay. What are well, you drinking what, tonight, governor? Well, Mary, I don't know if you know this, but um, it's uh, it, yesterday was International Women's Day. Right. And you're the only international woman I know. So in your honor, Ooh. I had to drink Labatt's Blue today. Ew. I had to do it because I have to represent. I had to represent the international woman who I know. And the only co <laughs> coffee sweet, mug but, I oh have God. that has a woman is Mary Surratt. So I'm drinking out of my Mary Surratt mug, which, um, Hey, it's sort of it's sort of appropriate for the episode. We're going to talk about sort of it's it's she's going to be mentioned, but that's what I have. So now uh, that being said, what do you what, what's your story? What, what are you I, drinking? I mean, first of all, it's funny that you have the Labatt Blue because um, the girl I'm going to be talking about tonight is actually Canadian as well. So I mean, I guess we'll pay a little bit of homage to her as well with that. Um, I am drinking Robo Hop by Great Lakes Brewery out of Toronto, which is just a random IPA. Um, yeah, I couldn't find one in relation to International Women's Day. And my mug is my, um, yeah, again, the background fucks with that. Um, mm -hmm. It's my George Mead mug. Um, and I didn't, I, I'm ashamed to say, I don't have a mug with a female from the Civil War on it like you do. So that makes you just that much cooler than me. Um, that is true. But I picked General Mead because Sarah Edmonds, uh, the girl I'm going to be talk about, talking about, actually served in the Army of the Potomac which General Meade was the commander of, although they weren't, didn't, he wasn't the commander of it when she was still in it. So we're anyway. going to talk about, we're going to talk, so we'll talk a little second Michigan today. We're going to have a little fun with that whole yeah, thing. So we will. we'll talk about that. But as you, I don't know if you know this, Mary, you probably don't, but it's officially Women's History Month around these parts. Okay. Shocking. And, Anybody watching this can see that you know, I've got my Goddess of Victory shirt and on, so, which was, and, I have, a shirt that says goddess of victory on it which was um our friend over at the tattooed historian john heckman mm -hmm. he made these shirts mm -hmm. in for women's Hi history month of 2019 and okay I very cool one, so that's what i'm wearing right now okay well i mean i guess it's considering it is women's history month i'm going to refrain from making fun of you know making fun of all of rotis howard's running abilities and 
the Cleveland Indians, and of course DQ. I'm, I'm going to play it straight. I'm going to. Oh gonna, my I'm god, gonna, I'm gonna you nice don't have to, you, Mary. To. I, I'm, I'm going to be nice to you. I, I feel like I have to. Oh my god, does and, this mean I can be an absolute bitch to you then? So as we were saying, okay, um, but but anyway, so to to that end, anyway, I thought it would be, if I, we talked about this. We thought it'd be fun to take a break from the Civil War battles and the carnage to talk about some women and talk about some of the things that they did yep. for their respective causes. Uh, and they don't really get the credit that they deserve. Now, when most people think of the Civil War and they think of women, they, you know, you a lot of folks automatically think of nurses. You think of Dorothy Dix, you think of Clara Barton. Yeah, and, um, uh, Bickerdike as well. People yeah. also like the other role they had like that I read an article was as a camp follower. And it's like, oh, they did more than that. Well, like- it's, you it's, but you're, 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 you're exactly what you're saying is it's it's important to know that women did a lot more than that. They did. I mean, we're, we're going to talk specifically about two roles tonight, one of soldiers and one of spies. Yeah. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to each talk about a specific one. And then two weeks from now, we're going to come back. We're going to do two more. Yep. That's what we're going to kind of do. Okay. So, so tonight we'll do part, part one. Um, of female spies tonight we're going to talk about women mary all right we're yes talk about we're that, talking right? about yeah we are and there was <laughs> there was approximately 250 women who served in the confederate army and 400 in the union um as soldiers now some of these soldiers were actually like field nurses like the the girl i'm going to be talking about she was a field nurse but she actually does have some combat experience and all that but women definitely played a role in the civil war there was many of them that who did that disguised themselves disguised themselves and you know just in doing my research i think for as many as we know that these you know 650 apparently there had to be so many more than that um, well there was a lot of you know in our friend were, lisa samia we'll have on it pretty soon it's about the yeah. nameless and faceless women of the civil war and yeah. there's countless of them for so many ones so um there are countless women that we could discuss there's no question about that um and this is a subject that people should absolutely study more. Um, but we've decided, like I said, to each choose one for tonight just so yeah. we can go. Um, I'm going to talk about Sarah Slater, Mary. You okay, are. the woman they call the elusive veiled lady. We're going to talk about her. You know, Slater. Um, she also went by Kate Thompson. She went by Olivia Floyd. Also went by Kate Brown. Um, and she still remains one of the most mysterious people, uh, male or female, of that era that is still studied today right well there's um, not even a, a photograph of her right is there there isn't and she's a truly truly a true enigma and because of a lot of studies that we'll talk about especially some recent study into her it's she's kind of getting a little light shine upon her um her background led to her to become one of the most valuable members of that confederate underground that network to canada mary speaking of canada again Mm-hmm. And she also has a has a you know a dotted line to you know to the Lincoln assassination yeah, we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. So so real I, what I want to do, Mary, is I want to talk about who is this mysterious veiled lady that we talk about, the Sarah Slater. So Sarah Antoinette Gilbert, Mary, she was born in Middletown, Connecticut, of all places. Another Connecticut person, born in January. So she's 12th from of, New England. She is, Darwin 12, 1843, to Dr. Joseph Gilbert and Antoinette Reynaud. Now, they called her Nettie. That was her nickname growing mm-hmm. up. And um, their family had French heritage. They spoke fluent French on the, in the household. They were, they were French-speaking people, right? Now, their family did break apart. Um, Dr. Gilbert would, uh, would move in with his two sons, as well as, uh, as, well as Sarah, to, to Goldsburg, uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina, and then eventually she moved to a place called Kinston, North Carolina. Now, Antoinette, the mother, she stayed behind with the couple's oldest son. And what was weird about it was Antoinette was pregnant at the time of the split. Now, I'm not going to make any make any guesses here. But I'm going to guess that pregnancy is probably why they split. And there's probably a story that's probably best set for a Springer episode. But Ugh. that's what that's that's what happened. You are but, not the father. <sighs> <laughs> um, in, in the winter of 1860, 1861, right, 17 year old Sarah, okay, and her brother Robert are going to move to New Bern, New Bern, North Carolina. And this is where she really blossomed, okay. Um, by all accounts, and this is the one constant about Sarah Slater, is that she was an absolute knockout. That's what everyone seemed to say about mm-hmm. her. She was described as exotic looking, an exotic looking French speaking woman with dark hair and dark eyes. And she was the obvious, uh, uh, you know, object of attention 
for almost every guy. That's just seemingly that's how it was. Now, uh, she was said to be beautiful, charming, and intelligent. Um, you know, while she was in New Bern, you know, she was boarding with the family of a guy named John L. Pennington, um, who was the editor of the, of the New Bern now Progress newspaper, right? So she, so she mm. was kind of making connections. Now, one speaking of connections, Mary, one night she's going to meet a guy named Rowan Slater. Now, he was a dashing dance instructor at the New Bern Academy, and their wow. romance. Their romance took an, took on the image of a 19th century dirty dancing is what it did. Now, there's no record if anyone tried to put Nettie in the corner. We don't know, okay? <laughs> but I will say that 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 relationship really blossomed. Now, mm-hmm. Rowan was the son of a rich plantation owner named um, from Rowan County, and he uh, and Rowan graduated from Trinity College and he studied violin and dance. So he, you know, that's what he was he was into, right? Very musical. It was okay. It wasn't long until Sarah and Rowan became hot and heavy, right? Mm. And they, they quickly fell in love. And in June of 1861, just one month after the state of North Carolina seceded from the Union, they get married, okay? Now, Sarah's brothers, um, the three of them anyway, they all signed up to fight for the Confederacy. And eventually, Rowan did as well. And he's going to sign on to Company A of the 20th North Carolina, they were known as the Carabas Guards, and he signed on sometime in 1863, okay? The 20th North Carolina Mary, in case you're curious, their original commander was Alfred Iverson, right? So it all kind of Ooh. ties together, right? Wow. Now, there's, I tried to find when he signed up because I was curious, okay? Yeah. Because if he signed up prior to July of 1863, Rowan Slater would have been in Gettysburg, and he would have been part of that infamous ill-advised Iverson's Pitts March. Oh, with the 20th North yeah, Carolina, right? Now, that North that 20th North Carolina, if you remember, they took 65% casualties yep. that day. They lost 122 men in the field uh, near Oak Ridge. Now, if he was there, he survived it, and he will make it all the way to the end of the war. And the, North, the 20th Carolina was at Appomattox in April of 65. They made it all the way to the very end, right? So before Rowan goes off to fight, what he does is he brings Sarah to his parents' plantation, okay? Because, and this is in Salisbury, North Carolina now. And he does it because he doesn't want her to be lonely at home and bored yeah. and all that, right? Um, but it doesn't take long for Sarah to realize, guess what? Rowan's parents, they don't like her too much. In fact, they hate her, right? Really? Why? They just don't like her. I mean, they're, they're a high-level family. Who knows? Who knows why? But what they do is they make Sarah into like a like a housemaid, like a maid thing. So she's she's oh, a, wow. she's like a servant. So she yeah. that's the job that she has, and she and so she hates it, and she is miserable. Okay, she's um you know she's like you with you know crack that last beer when someone steals it on you, right? That's right. Oh, when you do, month. I know I can't be nice, can be mean to you. I forgot. I promised, right? But she okay. is miserable. Okay, and what she wants to do, her mother is up in New York City. And she wants to go visit her mother because she, I mean, she hates it there. She wants to see someone yeah. she, that she knows. She wants to go see, wants to go see her mom who's up in New York City. There's a problem though, Mary, is that New York City, I don't know if you know this, is in the North. And so she has to cross into enemy territory. So what she has to do, she has to go to Richmond, okay? And yeah. she has to get a pass to go to New York City. And she goes to Richmond, and when she does, her life is going to completely change when she goes to Richmond. Intrigue. Right? Intrigue. Dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so so while she goes to Richmond, okay, she's applying for a pass to go to New York City, right? And she is noticed by two people, Secretary of War James Sneddon and Secretary of State Judah Benjamin. Now, it's likely she was noticed because of her appearance initially. Boys will be boys, Mary, okay? That's probably why she was noticed, right? <laughs> But they all, they started talking to her and they were suddenly captivated by two things, how smart she was Mm -hmm. and that she spoke French. Okay. And they sat around and said, shit, you know what? This might be somebody we can use. I think I know they're, they're going to send her. So exactly. So what, what they were looking for at the time, and this is getting towards the late in the war. Now they're looking for someone who could pass between the United States and Canada in who, who could pose as a French Canadian citizen and go to Montreal and not raise suspicions from anyone in the North. And they found her and they were like, oh my God, we've, you know, finally, right? Now, 
she so she agrees to this. Now, why does she mm -hmm. agree to it? Because she was bored. I mean, her husband's fighting a war and she decides she's going to take this dangerous job and she just, she just does it. So she probably is YOLOs it, right? And she's told if she's ever caught that she's going to sit there and say, I'm a French citizen. I want asylum. Take me to the French embassy. I, 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 I'm not part of yep. this whole thing, right? So they for the Rebs, they found the perfect spy to go back and forth to Montreal now. And it was right under their nose, right? Now, this is, again, I said before, this is getting towards the end of the war. Her yep. first assignment's not going to be until February of 1865. So I was how reading that about is, right? her. She's very, yeah. she's getting started very late in the war. But they give her an important task on day one. You know what her task is? Her task is to, is to deliver money and more importantly, deliver documents to those Confederate soldiers who pulled off that raid at St. Albans in Vermont. Yeah. That's her job, right? So St. Albans raid, okay. Uh, was that plane that was 26 Confederates who were, were going to sneak down from Canada into Vermont, and they were going to rob a bunch of banks. And what they were going to do was they were going to try to raise money, but they were hoping to scare the shit out of the Union guys so much yeah. that it was going to somehow pull troops away from Petersburg because they were all sieging that area, right, and send them north to defend the northern border. And that's what they were hoping for, right? Yeah. This about moving, you know, don't forget the manpower thing we talked about, right? And that's kind of what the plan was. But the Raiders, they did get the money, okay, um, and they successfully got back into Canada. But what happened when they got back into Canada, guess what happened? They got arrested by mm -hmm. the Canadians who probably said, sorry, we have to arrest you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Right? We're so yeah the Mounted Police show. But, Actually, no, it wouldn't have been the Mounted Police. They, no. It probably wasn't. It was probably, you know. <laughs> but they arrest them thinking that they're, they're, just, um, they're just American bank robbers. Yeah. And they would that, and that's what they were. So um, what they were going to do is they arrest these 26 Confederates and they're going to extradite them back to the United States for mm -hmm. trial. And these, these, these guys are scared shitless because they know the second they go back, their identities are going to be found out. OK, it, it's the Confederate Raiders. And uh, unfortunately, they'll have to be hanged. That's probably what's going to happen to them, right? Yeah. So what happens is the um, what's what's the papers that Sarah had were documents that proved the Canadian authorities that they were not bank robbers, that they were Confederate mm -hmm. agents. And as soon as she showed up and showed them the Canadian authorities these papers, they said, "Okay, well, they're Confederates. Now we're not going to extradite them anymore because we're not going to do it because now they're they're, they're Confederates." So bad. Yes. And by the way, we're going to set them free. We're going to let them go. And that's what they did, right? And my country it's, was like neutral, supposedly. You know, <laughs> in the, in the, in the, in, and so it was an important mission, right? And the thing about Sarah is whenever she traveled, she wore a black veil, okay? And it's why she got the nickname, the Veiled Lady. Um, she, so she did this primarily because she didn't want to be seen Right. And allegedly, she got so good at her disguise uh -huh. that even her own Confederate fellow operatives didn't. They faked faked them out too. She was that good at it, oh. right off right off the bat, right? Now, unlike her peers like Bell Boyd or or, uh, or Rose Greenhow, mm -hmm. most of Slater's activities um, are really unknown to this day. Um, she really, the, what they know of is that she participated in three three missions. The first one was the yeah. St. Albans mission, right? Um, that was the very first one. Now, after she after she left Canada, after dropping off those papers for the St. Albans guys, right? Yeah. She found herself in New York City, of all places, Mary, and she is gonna and she's gonna meet another rebel uh, courier. She's supposed to meet a guy named Augustus Howell in New York City. That's who she's supposed to meet. Mm. Augustus can't make it, so he sends someone to stand in for him to go meet Mary um, to go meet um, Sarah Slater. The guy who he sends to go beast Sarah Slater is a guy named John Surratt. That's who she sends. Okay? Wow. So she sends John Surratt to go meet Slater. Now, what's um in the plan was um, Surratt's going to meet Slater, and they're going to go back to Washington, D.C., and they're going to meet up with Howell at that point. That's how it's going to go. I can't make it. Go get her. Bring it back to Washington. We'll have a big kumbaya. Who knows? We'll see how mm -hmm. that's how it's going to go, right? So Surratt has no idea what Slater looks like. No idea, right? So she, he, she tells him that she's going to meet him in front of what's called the A.T. Stewart's department store, which is a real swanky, fancy little department store in New York City. Allegedly, Mary Lincoln used to shop there, Mary. 
No, you know, I'm I'm shocked at all by that. Anyway, is that where she bought all the but, flub dubs? <laughs> probably. But what she did was, <laughs> so so Slater told um Slater told Surratt, I'll be in front of the store and I will have a horsehair switch that I will be twirling between my fingers. That's how you know it's me. And so that well, she is this did like that. some kind okay. of Barton key shit with the handkerchief. It, it, like it, it, who knows? But that but that's what she did, and that's how they, they found it. So Surratt meets her and goes oh my god and is like gaga over her he can't but he can't believe it so he's um he's completely enamored with her and his heart so um he he you know he, he tells um he tells a livery stable owner named brooks stabler okay great name for stable or stable <laughs> stabler. Not for nothing, okay? so <laughs> did he own he, stabler stables uh, maybe he did right but surat tells him that he has a woman on the brain Right. And that because he was immediately oh smitten with this drop dead dime of a Confederate operative that she sounds like, she. you wants, know, from right? what I know about John Surratt, it sounds like he might have banged anything that moves. So. Well, yeah, well, you have to get in line <laughs> for this one. Right. But that, but so, so but that that meeting that takes place in Washington, D.C., uh, between Slater and Augustus Howell and John Surratt is going to take place in front of uh, in front of a boarding house on a 541 H Street, which is owned by John Surratt's mother, Mary. Okay, that's check out my meet. background, okay. YouTube watchers. Yep, there you go. There you go. So, um, and then following that meeting, um, they're gonna head down to to Richmond, right? Now, whatever Sarah's second mission was, this is the completion of her first mission. The second mission takes place in March of 1865. So look at the timing here. So this is getting close to the end, right? And again, is gonna involve a trip to Montreal. Now she made it there again, pretty much without an issue, because she has no real problem. Um, on her way back to Richmond, she's going to stop again and spend the night at Mary Surratt's boarding house. This is on March 25th, 1865 in Washington. And reportedly, um, Slater got the attention of another, another person who lived in the house, a guy named Louis Weichmann, Mary, okay, who apparently was Gaga as well, oh. and happily gave up his room so she could sleep in it. If she if she chose to, so he gave up his he gave up his room for her. So I they, don't know why were, that is creepy. It just is. It, it just is. But for she she had a way. Uh, she just she just did right now. Um, whatever message that Mary uh, I keep saying Mary was Sarah was was carrying from Canada uh, must have been pretty important. A Confederate agent named General Edward Gray Lee, who's up in Montreal, he's going to write earlier on March twenty twenty second that he. Um, he, helped, he wrote, I helped to get the messenger off and I pray she may go safely. So she, they were, whatever this was, that whatever the message was, it was, must have been pretty important, right? Now, not long after Slater is going to arrive at Mary Surratt's boarding house, Sarah, John, and Mary are all going to are all going to leave together from Maryland. They're all going to go because mm -hmm. they're supposed to meet up with Augustus Howell. Augustus Howell is supposed to help Sarah across the Potomac to get to Richmond, kind of like, you know, George, you know, at Surratt, when you talk about Booth down the road, yep, right? Yep. They're supposed to help ferry uh, Sarah Slater over the, over the Potomac to get to Richmond, okay? Um, there's a problem, though, okay? The problem is they find out when they get to Maryland that Augustus Howell got his ass arrested, and he ain't coming, right? Yikes. So they find, they find out that he's been arrested. He's been hauled off the old Capitol prison, right? So guess who happily joins and signs on to help her cross, of course, is John Surratt. Of course. I'll do it. So he's going to do it, and he's going to actually take Sarah over the river and go all the way back to Richmond, right? They're going to get there on April 1st, 1865, um, and right before they head back to Washington on April 3rd. This is going to be Sarah's third mission and the third and final one. This mission is going to take place while the Confederacy is falling. Okay, with the rebel capital about to fall, Sarah is going to is, is given instructions, and she's given she's been entrusted to take a bunch of rebel gold. Okay, and take it to Canada, and then to Montreal, and then direct the authorities to send it to England. Okay, so they gave her the Confederate golds. Okay, that's wow. what they gave her to do. So um, on the third, both Sarah and John Surratt are going to get back to Washington, and they're going to meet with an actor named John Wilkes Booth. And Master. it wasn't long; he <laughs> was. And so they're going to meet or on the third, and then Sarah is going to leave with the, with the gold, and she's going to fall off the planet and disappear with the gold. She's going to gone. She's, that's seemingly what they think happened. She's going to yeah, go. and that's that's where this 
the story is so intriguing because when you and I have talked about her before, like that's kind of where we left off, right? Like we just assumed she was gone, right? And something happened to her, but as you discovered, well, that's not the case. Well, well, it, right. So, so the whole the whole thing is um, the whole thing is basically she she disappears. Now, eleven days later, Booth is going to shoot Lincoln. Okay. Yeah. And 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 what's going to happen is this mysterious veiled woman is going to be a subject of a lot of talk because mm-hmm. people see her, but don't see her face. I don't know who she is, but they yeah. know she was there. So during this investigation, testimony about this mysterious woman always wearing a black veil hanging around the Surratt boarding house is going to be mentioned, but her identity is never really established, right? Reportedly, one of the conspirators, George Atzerat, we talked about a few minutes ago, he describes her in the testimony of of all about 20 years of age, good looking and well dressed with black hair and black eyes, with a round face who knew all about the affair and added, she went with Booth a great deal. Now, again, we talked a lot about Atzerod and he was trying to spit, he was trying to save his ass, right? Oh, of he course was, he was. Absolutely. He, he was the one who was, was pointing fingers, trying to get off, and it, it yep. didn't work out. Now, the authorities, okay, were never able to prosecute Sarah Slater because. They never really knew who she was. And she kind of disappeared into obscurity, right? Mm -hmm. She kind of remains an enigma until the mid-1980s. That's how long this took, right? When a historian named James O. Hall was able to piece together the history of Sarah Slater. Now, this Hall, um, if you study Mary Surratt, the uh, Surratt Society, you know who he is. He's a researcher who spent over 50 years studying the Lincoln assassination. And he's remembered today as being one of the absolute gurus of John Wilkes Booth, the Surratt family, and the Lincoln assassination. Um, if you go to Surratt's Tavern in Maryland, uh, yep. there's a James O. Hall Research Center, Mary, mm-hmm. and it's got thousands and thousands of books of, of, about that of the, uh, there you go to. You can yeah. actually go visit it today. You can't take a book out, but you can study there. It is the holy grail of, um, of Booth and assassination stuff, if you ever get a chance to go down there, okay? Mm. But this is what they discovered. Hall did. Sarah Slater didn't really disappear, Mary, okay? After the war, you know what she's going to do? She's going to reunite with her husband, Rowan. Remember him, the Confederate? Yep. She's going to reunite with Rowan, Rowan Slater. But guess what happens right when they, they meet? She divorces him. She dumps him, which is weird. Whoa, it that, that often. What okay? the hell? So she divorces him, and she moves to New York City, where her, her mother originally was. Right? right, yeah. She gets she gets remarried to a guy named J- Jacob Long, who is the superintendent of the Harlem Gas and Light Company. And he's also a local politician. Now, Long is about 20 years older than Sarah. So he's an older guy. Yeah. He's going to die in 1889. And Sarah's going to move to Poughkeepsie um, and begin work as a nurse of all things. This is Sarah Slater now, right? Poughkeepsie, in case you're curious, is 80 miles from Albany in New York. Oh, my God. Just in case you're you're curious where that is. I've been to Poughkeepsie, whatever it is. Okay. Well, you've been to Albany, too. Anyway. I've been to Albany. so, oh, so jump so jump ahead now, jump ahead a little bit up to 1912. Sarah's sister, Laura Spencer, okay, she's gonna die in New York City, okay, and make Laura's husband, a guy named William White Spencer, a widower. He's a union vet. He's a Civil War union yeah. vet, this guy, okay. So just about a year later, and before Laura's body's cold, William gets remarried to guess who? Sarah Slater. Oh wow. Laura's sister. Right. So um, and the happy couple is going to move uh, from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So she's going to marry her her sister's uh, ex uh, husband there. Now, Sarah's going to become a widow herself uh, not long after William is going to die in, in October of 1914. Right. And Sarah's going to go back to Poughkeepsie, where she'll live the rest of her die- day. She's going to die in June 20th of 1920 of kidney disease. Mm-hmm. And she's buried today at Poughkeepsie Rural Cemetery near her mother. Now, funny thing, we talk about this recently the funny thing about her grave okay is whether it's by design or by accident but she made her birth date 14 years later to be younger and a lot of speculation wow. was, it just a mis- was it just a mistake or was it um to hide her identity or just be- to be younger who the hell knows but it, but but that's how it says right um and that's so crazy i just thought of another person who kind of obscured their birth date and that was dan sickles <laughs> Oh, yeah. There you go. So, but Sarah's life from the Civil War, whatever role she played in that Lincoln assassination, is always going to be an enigma. 
in many, a lot of people try to tie the pieces together, but there's just, you have to kind of fill in the gaps. There's just not a lot out yep. there. Mm-hmm. Um, something she's something she's a vital link between John Wilkes Booth and Richmond and Montreal. Then there's, there's, maybe there's something to do with that. Um, but the big question about Sarah is what happened to Confederate gold? And that's the interesting thing. About yeah, it, right? this is the one thing I've been really looking forward to you talking about in this episode oh, so, is this Confederate gold. So she leaves and the gold vanishes and they don't really find it. And you say yeah. every so often you'll see historical shows with the Confederate gold. They disappear. It's here in they, Canada somewhere. Well, well they, they talk a lot about Jefferson Davis taking the treasury and there's all that. But she took a lot of money with her and no one really knows what happens. But here's what's interesting. And most people thought for the most part that was just lost to history and whatever but when she dies in 1920 she she leaves a will now this is a woman who you know she was basically she only was a confederate operator for about three months so she didn't have a yeah. long time to make money she um she didn't really have a lot she didn't really work she didn't mm-hmm. come from a lot of money i mean she, rowan slater you know, she, he he had money but um but she didn't really get much of that right so when she, she had when she died, she had no debt, which is rare. Okay, she paid for her gravestones herself. She prepaid it, and she left several interesting items in her will, including mm-hmm. jewelry made of gold and ivory, a uh, diamond lockets, gold bracelets, cash payouts of um, worth thirty thousand dollars in today's money to random people and friends. Not to mention the countless gift cards to DQ she left that she must have got. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the DQ. But, but, but the reality, and, and again, you know, no one knows what happened. But for a woman who didn't have a lot, who disappeared with money, she had a lot to give at the end and a lot of mm-hmm. strange gifts that she gave away. Yeah. Um, and again, this is just speculation. No one knows if this is the Confederate money, but it's just funny when you think about it that you know is, is is this part of that money that she was entrusted to deliver to canada that didn't seem to go anywhere but mm-hmm. we'll never know and that's what makes history great about this stuff especially hers because there's so much intrigue to her and so Very she's she's, fasc- she's fascinating to study again someone who you know her husband goes off to fight and she d- doesn't like her in-laws well, you know, a lot of folks probably do and she ends up with an opportunity to kind of fight for the cause and she wasn't a big crazy confederate rah-rah person a green o type person but whatever whatever drew her into it she embraced it quickly and she really took off with it and she really made a quick name for herself and you know the the lady in the veil is is one of those great civil war spy mysteries that we'll never really know and hall did a good job digging out a lot of it and shining a lot of light on it Mm -hmm. but again no one really knows no one really knows what what her deal was no one even knows what she even looks like that's what's so cool about it that's a that's a interesting thing about her the intriguing thing about her is you know there's no picture and you know i mean you did awesome with this like i remember when you were telling me the other day because we had one perception of her that we don't really know and then all of a sudden like you know we were talking one day about this episode and you're like she's got a will and i'm like oh my god this is amazing you know and this is i mean it it goes back to what is fun about doing this is the stuff that you find but you know, she, she is a woman from the civil war that she clearly has a huge role, but we'll never really know what that role was, especially when it comes to the Lincoln assassination. Um, the fact that she was never questioned, right? Like it, well, she was never brought in as a witness because nobody well, well, knew who the fuck well, she see, was. See, right. Even that they don't know. Cause there are yeah. some, rep- there are some reports that she was brought in interrogate or oh, somebody okay. who or someone who may have been her but they didn't know who she was i mean they they, they did they did bring in some people who you know could have been her and they talked yeah. about her but who but whoever they did brought into they released her because there's no no one ever saw her so i mean by all accounts she did disappear there are some there are some reports that they did bring her in dirt after the assassination but I think the reality, she probably was gone at that point. She was probably on her way wherever mm-hmm. she did go. Um, she probably made it as far as New York City and stopped there. But again, um, that's the thing about it. This is not one of those situations where you can sit there and look and read and read memoirs and know exactly what happened. Yeah. And whatever happened to her is whatever you want to happen to her. Whatever that, That's what the cool thing about it. If you want to believe it, that, that she gave away all that gold uh, and all that Confederate money, then, then knock yourself up. But there's, no, there's nothing to tie it together. But it's yeah. one of those great open-ended stories that you can speculate forever about. 
Oh, it is. And I love that you picked her as the, the woman you chose to talk about. I mean, I've learned so much about her, you know, like, I mean, we've discussed her a few times before, but, you know, to know about this will and all the stuff that she gave away in it. And it's just, it's like, wow, like, where did she get the money to do that? <laughs> you know, it's, and that's, what's really interesting. And the, the Confederate gold thing is something that comes up all the time and really intrigues people. And like, we'll never really know. Right. I mean, she may have hit the New York lotto. We'll never know. She may have had, she may, you know, she may have had some money um, that just wasn't reported about it, but it's, yeah. but it is convenient. It, it just is. And you know what? Everyone likes a good, uh, a good, you know, mm-hmm. a good story, a good mystery. And that, that it's certainly the, the Sarah Slater story is definitely one of the, the better mysteries of the civil war. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Because it is a true mystery right to the point where she covered yep. her face with a veil all along, which, which, which made it good. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll never know. And she might have been, you know, maybe she was a vital piece of that assassination. Maybe she, she was. She could have been. We'll but, never know. But, you know. but we'll never know. We'll never know. But it's, we'll leave it to you to speculate, Mary. We'll let your mind wander on Sarah Slater. So what do you got? Um, so I have our second Sarah um, for this, which is um, she's actually Canadian. I know my my country was not the country of Canada then, but they were still referred to as Canadians. We were a British colony at that point. But I'm going to be talking about um, Sarah Emma Edmonds. Um, she was born in 1841 in New Brunswick, Canada, um, which at the time, as I said, was a British colony. So she's born out in the East Coast. She's on the islands. Um, and so she's born Sarah Emma Evelyn Edmondson. She will later be Sarah Emma Edmonds. And she will also be known as Franklin Flint Thompson. So this is a woman who disguises herself as a man to uh, join in the efforts for the Civil War. So her she's father... Also, she's also, also, she's also but, known, Mary, since the St. Patty's Day. She was also known as a woman named Bridget O'Shea. She was. Who was a Irish peddler selling soap and apples. Yep. So she did it all. So oh, she, <laughs> it, the funny thing is, is the one thing I've learned about studying some of these, uh, you know, looking at some of these women to look at for our episodes, you know, is they had quite, you know, they had a bit of a drama in them, almost like an actress, you know, like I think uh, Pauline Cushman was an actress. Um, so they, mm-hmm. they learn how to play these parts quite well. And, and Sarah Edmonds is is one of these ones and I'm going to explain why soon like why she just was so I think what inspired her to do this was something that was really interesting um so her father had been hoping for a son to help with his crops because he was a farmer and he resents his daughter and doesn't treat her very well and that's be also because her older brother had epilepsy so there was no way wow. that he could help his father in the capacity that he needed to unfortunately so her father took his anger out on on Sarah unfortunately um she grows up near Fredericton New Brunswick which is the major city in that area um she becomes an accomplished horseback rider she could shoot really well she was an excellent swimmer and she loved climbing trees at the age of nine she's given a book about the adventures of uh Fanny Campbell Fanny Campbell is a female pirate um, this is a book written by um, Maturin Marie Ballou in 1844, and it's about a young woman who lives in Lynn, Massachusetts in the 1770s, and her fiance ends up getting kidnapped by pirates, and Fanny decides to rescue him by dressing up as a man, and she calls herself Channing, and the book is said to have heavily influenced Sarah, and you can see that not only in her career in the Civil War, but in her memoirs as well. Her memoirs are well worth checking out. Um, she is just, you can tell she's into the adventure of it. And I'm sure this is like anyone who writes memoirs, I'm pretty sure she probably embellishes, but you can tell she's into this adventure. But at the age of nine, she's given this book. And it. I, I don't think it, it not only heavily influences her, but I think it's a comfort for her because her father does not treat her well. So she can go into this world where she is pretending she's Fanny, you know, and she can go on a, an adventure and all that. And it helps her to gain this independence, but she also gains it as we're going to see from her mother as well. Um, at She's eight, she's 15 years old when her father arranges a marriage for her. 
And she wants nothing to do with that. She pulls out her fuck this card. And she's like, nope, not doing it, doing this. And you know who helps her get out of it? Her mother. Her mother um, helps her run, run away. And this is at the time she changes her last name to Edmonds. Mm -hmm. And she lives and works with a family friend where she made hats. And within a year, um, she has a successful millinery shop, which is where you make hats in Moncton. And she's the co-owner of it. But her father eventually finds her and demands she returns home. But she doesn't want anything to do with that. She's like, I'm not going back. Forget it. I don't want into your arranged marriage, whatever. Um, so she moves to St. John and she assumes a male identity. And that's where she takes, takes on this name of Frank, Franklin Thompson. Um, and she says of this in her memoirs, I think I was born into this world with some sort of dormant antagonism towards men. My infant soul was impressed with a sense of my mother's endured wrongs. And I probably drew from her my love of independence and my hatred of male tyranny. Ooh which is, it's, it's really interesting. She sounds, says that, sounds, but sounds fun. she does, but it's, it's really interesting. Cause when we get, when we get to the end of her story, you know, she's not really against men. It's a man who she serves with that helps her get the titles and the pension that she eventually gets. Um, but that quote was really interesting. So, as I said, she assumes the name of Frank Thompson and she lands a job with Hurlbutt and Company, which was a Bible bookseller and publish it, publisher in Hartford, Connecticut. And New England was where she decided to call her home. Like she completely spit, splits from Canada and she's like, nope, not staying here. I'm going to go uh, to New England. So she sells Bibles door to door. And her boss said that Frank Thompson was the best salesman he'd seen in 30 years. It's your old job. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> retail, <laughs> former retailer, which I was like, I'm so proud of her for this. I'm like, oh my God. She's <laughs> have a minute to talk about Oliver Otis Howard. <laughs> God. <laughs> There's her Howard reference. Actually, yeah. no, that's not our only Howard reference. Oh, good. <laughs> Trust me. Stay tuned, folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the outbreak of the Civil War, she's in a place called Flint, Michigan. And this is believed to where she adds into her name. Um, she becomes Franklin Flint Thompson, just because she really liked it in Flint, Michigan, which um, I don't know if you've heard about Flint, Michigan. I've been, a, I've been in Flint, Michigan. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a mall that has a fish in it that is like 50 years old. Uh -huh. Yeah, That's anyway, cool. it's yeah. weird. Yeah, and they have water issues. Um, anyway, um, so she writes memoirs after the war called um, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. And that's where I get a lot of my quotes that are directly from her from. Uh -huh. um, so she enlists in the U Union Army as Franklin Flint Thompson, and she enlists as a field nurse. So she's not going to be like a combat soldier, although she does see some combat in the Civil War. She's very patriotic. Um, the one as I was reading through her memoirs, um, the one person she made me think of was Rufus Dawes for yeah. the level of patriotism uh, that she had. And this is a person who is not an American. You know, she's, uh, she's Canadian. And she said, war, civil war with all its horrors seemed inevitable. And even then was ready to burst like a volcano upon the most heavy and prosperous nation the sun ever had shone upon. The contemplation of this sad picture filled my eyes with tears and my heart with sorrow. It is true. I was not an American. I was not obliged to remain here during this terrible strife. And she goes on to say that she could have returned to Canada and she would have been welcomed by her family. But I think this is an area in her memoirs where she's kind of, I don't know, embellishing a little bit because of just the relationship that we know she had with her father but she was close with her mother and I think her siblings as well. Uh -huh. But she's very much throughout her memoir. She's very patriotic. Um, for someone that's not born in the U S like, you know, say Rufus Dawes was this, this girl, she's, you know, crossed an international border to come into the country. And she's like, you know, she hears about the civil war and she goes and enlists, you know, um, 
she's very pro union and she wanted to help. She's always very, re- she's also very religious as I'm going to get to in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, I, I think, mm, yeah, I thank God I am permitted in this hour of my adopted country's needs to express a title of the gratitude, which I feel toward the people of the Northern States. Um, so she enlisted 10 days after Lincoln's call up for troops. She goes to DC. Um, she is part of the second Michigan. Yeah. It's interesting. Cool. She, she was part of, she goes to company F, which is interesting yep. because you, you know who the recruiter was for this, the, 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 um, the, from Michigan there was Israel Richardson mm-hmm. who got, who got the more, who got the, took yep. the shell over there at Antietam. Um, and she'll be under a guy named Francis W. Kellogg. Right. Yep. So she joins a pretty, a pretty good regiment right off the bat. So that's, um, it's interesting. And, and we'll, as you'll, we'll find out as you talk about it, is she finds her way into a, a lot of places now. Oh, with, she with, ab- these Michi- with these Michigan men. She absolutely does. Like she mentioned, she's in Baltimore uh, after the riots occurred, but she makes a point in her memoirs of mentioning the six Massachusetts. Um, she arrives in DC. She visits the temporary hospitals and she notices there's lots of illnesses like typhoid fever. And there were thousands of men to take care of. Um, and she said, but for, for these, the government had no provisions as regards more delicate kinds of food, nothing but hard bread, coffee, and pork for stick and well. And she said that the sanitary commission had not yet come into operation. And the consequence was our poor sick soldiers suffered unspeakably from want of proper nutrition. So she is seeing this as she comes in here, you know, that these guys are, they're sick, but you know, the, the men who are healthy are also not getting the nutrition they need, but she's describing the conditions in DC as not being very good, just all the sick and the war Mm -hmm. hasn't even begun yet. Like they haven't even fought a battle. Right. Um, She talks about her experiences in the hospital, the suffering of the men, even before first bull run. Um, So July 15th, 1861, the second Michigan is ordered to bull run. And this is what she has to say about that. In gay spirits, the army moved forward, the air resounding with the music of the regimental bands and patriotic songs of the soldiers. No gloomy foreboding seemed to dampen the spirits of the men. I felt strangely out of harmony with with the wild, joyous spirit which pervaded the troops. I thought many, very many of those enthusiastic men who appeared so eager to meet the enemy would never return to relate the success or defeat of that splendid army. So she's got a very different attitude going into this. Now, whether this is, you know, we're talking about, she's writing about this in 1865 after she's experienced this. So, I mean, we don't know hundred percent of this is her thoughts, but it's um, it's interesting to read this and it's at first bull run that she's going to witness the first man getting killed. And she said like Mm -hmm. a shell just comes along and rips his legs off. Um, And she said, now the battle began to rage with terrible fury. Nothing could be heard save the thunder of artillery the clash of steel and the continuous roar of the musketry. And she said, the one thing she said that was really, I found shocking in her memoirs was many that day turned their backs upon the enemy and sought refuge in the woods. Some two miles distant were found torn to pieces by shell or mangled by cannonball, a proper reward for those who insensible to shame, duty, or patriotism, desert their cause and comrades in trying hour of battle and skulk away, cringing under fear of death. She's hard on these guys who are running away. Well, she, you know, it's funny how you mentioned the Rufus Dawes comparison, because it's actually very appropriate. And as well, as, as this perk goes a little further, you'll be able to see more of the comparisons, but Mm -hmm. a very patriotic person who finally gets into battle, unlike Dawes, we really took him to second Manassas and We'll talk about second Manassas here in a few minutes with her, mm-hmm. but but um, but she really gets her sees the elephant there if, if right at the beginning at Bull Run. Yeah, no, she she does, and she says that she had gone to war with no other ambition than to nurse the sick and care for the wounded. I had inherited from my mother a rare gift of nursing, and when not too weary or exhausted, there was a magnetic power in my hands to soothe the delirium. And so she she's a caregiver. I mean, this is the kind of she's very much. A female who is a you know today she would be called a tomboy you know she can climb right. trees she can shoot a rifle whatever but she's also got that i get i don't want to say feminine i you know but yeah, she's very much 
she cares a lot and well you you'll know. see we'll see her we'll see her history you know going forward with her experience with with you know, as a nurse and so and she does a whole but she kind of does every job possible a courier a spy a nurse so she oh, yeah. does it all she, she's oh she does Swiss the Army combat man, thing but, too you know, um, but I think I think she definitely cares. I mean, it, it all starts with caring. She cares about the union, and that that was her her you know her caring. So you know she has that really hard, obviously that bad background with her father, uh, being born the wrong gender. Yep. She's punished for that. Like she can do anything about that. Um, and she really spends the, the early part of her life kind of finding that thing to gravitate to. Yeah, right? she's. Uh, and, and so finally, you know, mustering in with those Michigan men uh, in Company F, she kind of finds her calling. Um, and that's what's interesting about Sarah Edmonds is that she, as 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 her life continues throughout this war and, and things happen to her that for limits to what she can do, she keeps finding different things to stick around, which is really neat. Oh, she right? does. Absolutely. She's so patriotic. And she's also very descriptive when when she's talking about the battle. And I think we do see that like later on in Rufus Dawes memoirs, too. Um, she said the sight of the field is perfectly appalling. Men tossing their arms wildly, calling for help. There they lie bleeding, torn and mangled. Legs, arms, and bodies are crushed and broken as if smitten by thunderbolts. The grounds is crimson with blood. It is terrible to witness. Um, and then she says after Bull Run, she says that extraordinary march from Bull Run through rain, mud, and chagrin did more toward filling the hospitals than did the battle itself. There are great strong men doing, dying all around me. And while I write, there are three being carried past the window to the dead room. So she's writing about this too um, in a letter as she sees us, three men uh -huh. being carried past her, that she's witnessing all this um, and she's writing about it in real time. And she said that there is suffering which no pen can ever describe. Um, yeah. Which is like, I was like, holy shit. Like she's, she's seeing this all. She's also back. Sorry, go ahead. She was going to say she's seen some shit, Mary. She has. She's seen some shit. That's probably, that we, should be we, written we on need, we, need to, you know, we, we need to keep track of people who have seen the shit and just, and just keep track of people. many people have seen some shit. Know, I think so. That's, <laughs> that, that phrase has come quite a bit. Anyway, go on. Um, so she is back in D.C. after the battle and was there when McClellan takes command. Um, and she has high praise for him coming in, much like Rufus Dawes does, much like many of these men do that, there's someone coming in to maybe reshape the, like, you know, get this army into the shape that it needs to be someone that can be their commander. That isn't going to be a complete shit show. And she says of him, he proved himself equal to the task. And I think that even his enemies are willing to admit that there is no parallel case in history where there has been more tact, energy, and skill displayed in transforming a disorganized mob into an efficient and effective army. Well, not enough can be said about that because if you if you're going to build a strong house, you better have a strong foundation. Yeah, right. It just seems that a lot of people who um who don't don't particularly care for George McCollum Mary, and there's definitely people out there. It has yep. there are a few right who they seem to forget that stuff, and you you gotta realize that um that that a lot of that that original foundation was built in for exactly. for, for a lot of for a lot of people who bash him today. A lot of people back then seemed to like him. It's weird how that they works. did they did and you know like i get there's like the parrot gun incident there's a lot of other stuff with mcclellan but the at the end of the day you know this is a guy that came in and and he was highly respected by these people and she's writing this down you know in 1865 so after she's gone through the whole civil war she's writing this down how she felt you know that and saying like even his enemies would agree he he did this you know, despite all his faults, he built the army of the Potomac, you know, right. um, anyway, she ends up being appointed postmaster and she has to routinely ride 25 miles a day to pick up and deliver bags of letters and packages. And this work was really dangerous. And on one occasion, she rides over, um, a fellow postmaster who had been ambushed and shot the day before. I mean, who hasn't run over a mailman in their life, Mary, come on. I don't know. I haven't. Oh, maybe no. <laughs> anyway. God. Um, she's something? in the. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you got, you got something to what you want to fess up about on the internet? No, I don't need to do confessional right now. Thanks. 
<laughs> you like, remember I told you there was a squirrel? That was actually a mailman. <laughs> I'm actually wanted by the police. Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Um, so she's in the Virginia campaigns of 1862. So, you know, second bull run in Tina, um, Fredericksburg. She's also in Siege of Yorktown. Um, and it said around this time, she's started to do some espionage missions. Um, she talks about it in her memoirs, but it's not on her official records. Um, well, the, thing, the thing about her too is, you know, she takes that, that, the kind of that horrific injury at second Manassas. She does the legs. You know, so she's so th- there's a story where she's she's her horse is shot out, so she has to ride yep. a mule or something. Yeah, and she gets she gets thrown into a ditch, and she and she breaks her leg, and she suffers all kinds of internal injuries, and, and these injuries are going to plague her for the rest of her life, and, and and that's one of the reasons why she was able to get a pension that we'll talk about later was the yeah. score injuries. Yeah, right? and the funny thing is, is she glosses over that injury in her memoirs. It's so funny. It's like, she's almost ashamed of it. And she's like, no, no, I was fine. It's like, no, no, you had a fucking broken leg. Um, so after this, she gets into spying and she volunteers after she saw a spy that was had been hung, the union spy that had been hung. And she was interviewed by a a panel of high-ranking union officers. So whoever was on that, I'm not sure, but it's very dangerous work. Um, she did really a few, like quite a few interesting missions. Like one time she shaves her head, she blackens her skin with silver nitrate. She wore a plantation suit, as she says, and a black, like a curly black wig. And she went into a Confederate camp at Yorktown disguised as a slave answering to the name of Cuff. And Mm -hmm. she writes about her experiences in the memoirs, like how she was doing one type of labor and her hands got really blistered. So she had to do another type. Um, So she does various jobs, but while she's there, she's, she's, you know, you know, thinking in her mind, like how these defenses look like, what does she have to relate to the union when she gets back to them? She manages to make some rough sketches and McClellan uses these and he learns how to fire upon the rebel fortifications mm. from these sketches that she makes apparently well she's funny because she has another role she plays a, a confederate named uh, charles mayberry yeah um, and, and I, what i always got fascinated by by sarah Edmonds is the how she comes up with the names oh i know so yeah, yeah there's charles mayberry is one of her last ones she does um she's like a like an Irish don't, immigrant don't, at one don't point. Be bridge, uh, that's Br- Bridget O'Shea, uh, Charles yeah. Mayberry, obviously Cuff. Um, you know, <laughs> there's there's so there's so many that she has that it's just, it's just fascinating. I just she's very creative. I'll give her that. You know, no, she is, and she's almost like an actress in 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 this role. Um, like she says, I felt just as happy and comfortable as it was possible for anyone to be under similar circumstances. I am naturally fond of adventure a little ambitious and a good deal romantic. And this together with my devotion to the federal cause and determination to us to assist to the utmost ability to crushing the rebellion. Patriot patriotism was the grand secret of my success. And again, this is a woman who she's a Canadian. She's not even, you know, she's not a U.S. citizen. And Uh she's there and she's saying patriotism was the grand secret of my success. And that's very cool. No, it's, it certainly is. Everybody has their own, their own specific callings, you know? Um, and, and, and as the whole thing went on, you know, the war certainly took its toll on her is her body did kind of, we talked Absolutely. about the injury she had a second, yeah. you know, and, and you know, I know you're going to talk about some more stuff that's, that's going to happen to her. That's going to kind of finish her off with this, with this war, but, yeah. but certainly um, she gave it all in a million different roles. And it's just another, another fascinating character, no doubt. Oh, oh, she did. And, you know, she's very ambitious. And as you said, she does other spy missions. She's an Irish immigrant woman. Um, she be she disguises herself as a black female slave all well everybody around her thinks she's a man she's very convincing with this um at antietam she encounters a dying soldier and um this dying soldier confesses that she's actually a girl and who had enlisted as a man to be near her brother who had already been killed in battle 
and Sarah makes sure she's buried. And that was one of the most like sad, that's the saddest story I read. Like imagine being a female soldier, you're a sky, you're a female, you're, you're a nurse. You're supposed to be a nurse, male soldier. And you encounter another soldier who confesses she's female. You're also a female. And you make every effort to make sure she's buried. Right. Um, the other thing about her, she's very religious. This is where Howard's going to come in, obviously. Um, but, but Sarah says the Christian soldier is the best soldier. Mm-hmm. And this is where in her memoir, she mentions Howard. And she talks about a speech that he gives at Philadelphia. She quotes so much of it in her memoir. She clearly really, um, I think she admired him for being the Christian soldier because that's how she was. She constantly mentions, you know, Bible scriptures and God in throughout her memoirs. Um, so she's very much like the, uh, as I said to you earlier today, Darren, she's very much the female version of Oliver Otis Howard. She certainly is. She certainly is. Um, um, she couldn't, couldn't run as fast after she broke those legs like Howard. Did. Probably but, not. No. no. Um, but she mentions Howard a few times, as I said, talks about the speech he gives at Philadelphia, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so on March 20th, 1863, she ends up getting transferred to Louisville, Kentucky. And she's, um, she's there spying again, doing some espionage. And she ends up getting conscripted in the Confederate army. And she said, I did not despair, but trusted in, in providence and my own ingenuity to escape from this dilemma. Um, she manages to like make it so, and she's in, uh, mounted infantry in the Confederate army. She makes it so her horse gets across union lines, but then he, the horse goes back across and the rebel captain draws his saber at her and she ends up just like shooting him. Um, and then at that point, everybody wants to kill her, but she somehow manages to escape. Um, but her horse ends up getting badly cut by the saber on his neck. So she ends up being barred from spying in that area for fear of being recognized, but she does one more, one more mission and that's to break up the Confederate spying in Louisville, Kentucky. And to do that, this is where she becomes that persona of Charles Mayberry, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So she ends up working with a local outspoken merchant. He's outspoken about his views of the South, which he's very pro Southern, um, she manages to gain his trust and he introduces her to a sutler spying for the South while selling supplies to union soldiers and also another agent who is a photographer. And because of this, the spying manages to be found. So that is her last mission because unfortunately she goes to Vicksburg, she gets posted near a military hospital and she ends up coming down with malaria oh. and she can't go into a hospital there because Frank Thompson is a man and Sarah Edmonds is a woman (laughs) and she, she doesn't want to reveal that. So she goes all the way from Vicksburg, Mississippi to Pittsburgh, puts on a dress and admits herself to a hospital. Well, if you want to go to knowingly go to Pittsburgh, Mary, unless you're Bill Belichick, there's nothing good going to Pittsburgh. She was desperate. Um, (laughs) When she's cured, she comes across an army bulletin, which listed her male alias, Frank Thompson, as a, as a deserter, which is punishable by death. And she's going to carry that with her for a number of years, being a deserter. So until the end of the war, she worked as a nurse with the U.S. Christian Sanitary Commission. Um, in 1865, she's going to write her memoirs, Nurses and Spy, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army, um, comprising the adventures of and experiences of a woman in hospitals, camps, and battlefields. It's a bestseller. Um, and she donates the money to the U S war relief, which is really awesome. She returns to Canada with Linus, um, Seeley, also from new Brunswick. Um, and she had met him in Harper's Ferry in 1864. They marry in 1867. They have three sons, one who joins the army. And he says he joins because, just like mama did. So she was clearly open with her family about the fact she had been in the, in the army, you know, Mm -hmm. um, 1883, she goes to Flint, Michigan 
and she's looking for an old army buddy named Damon Stewart um, from the second Michigan. And she finds him in a dry goods store and she asks him if he knows what happened to Frank Thompson. And he said, are you his mother? And he, and she's like, no. And she's like, are you his sister? And she says, no. And finally she writes down on the piece of paper, be quiet. I'm Frank Thompson. And he's like, what the fuck is going on? And she, she sits him down and she tells him, and she's, she asks him, did you ever question my sex? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no at all. But then he says, we jested about his little boots and called Frank, our little woman, but he took it all in good part. Can you imagine, can you imagine in all honesty, you know, the, the, these, these soldiers who found out after the fact, right? Yeah. Um, just uh, how, just, just the surprise, just the stuff like, oh crap, what did I talk about? You know, did I, you know, did I, did I pee in front of her? But that's the thing, like he said that he looked at her and knew it was him. Yeah. From the way she looked, from how she was, even after, even in 1883. 20 years yeah, later, he knew that's something that, that it was, you know, Frank Thompson was actually the Sarah Emma Ed, Edmonds. Um, so Stuart helps her get her pension. He, he does a writing campaign going, writing to all the second Michigan that are left to get her recognition for her war service. She ends up getting a pension July 5th, 1884. She gets a special, special act of Congress grants her honorable discharge from the army for her sacrifice in the line of duty, her splendid record as a soldier, her unblemished character and disabilities incurred in service. She gets just a very small cash bonus and a pension of $12 a month. Um, she becomes one of two females admitted into the Grand Army of the Republic. The first was uh, a woman named Katie Brownwell, who's from R Rhode Island and she's buried in Providence, which is pretty cool. I think one of, the, one of the coolest things about things too is how much her Michigan guys embraced her. You know, they there's rallied that, around that, her. There's that there's that story where she goes to that 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 reunion, right? Yeah. Um, of the second Michigan, and she's she's just you know she's warmly recognized, and 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 and, uh, and, and, and so just imagine you know you you think you're done you know with Frank with Franklin Thompson, and that you're going to be dishonorably discharged and disgraced and. And knowing that 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 you know because of desertion and after everything she did or he did, however you want to call it, with this at the time, and knowing that they were good, that that desertion thing was going to be was would be removed, and, and that and she was be able to get a pension now, um, and that took a long time. It took eight years for her to get that. It took a yep. long time uh, to clear those those desertion charges and to get that pension in 1884. And for her to get the accolades, like you mentioned, about getting the GAR, um, and and that's how it was a big deal. And, and so it really is. It's really one of those those rare situations where it's like a real like a, a story that someone goes into this war with the best intentions, and 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 as their her role through injury and, and sickness affects it, um, and then be able to come full circle again, and not only kind of have be redeemed, but be welcomed and, and congratulated by your old peers who you fooled for all that time, right? Because they, they didn't remember a guy dressed, a woman dressed up as a man. They remembered someone's fighting with them and fighting fighting for them and the stuff they did. Yeah. And so um, and so for her, obviously, to get that pension is well-deserving and the GAR recognition is certainly deserving as well. It's, 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 a, it's, just, a, it's just a cool story. It, just it is. is. No, she's... She's definitely a, a cool female uh, that's involved in the Civil War. And, you know, she's just a member of the GR for a short period of time because she passes away on September the 5th, 1898. And the reason her family knows she does is because her dog, Jack, just barks all of a sudden in alarm and she'd had a stroke. So she's first buried in Laporte, Texas, which, which is where her and her husband had married or moved at one point. Um, and then she is di like, they dig up her grave, like they move her again to Houston and she's buried in the military section of Washington cemetery. She's the only female in the civil war veterans area there. 
and she's given full military honors on Memorial Day, which is really awesome. Well, she it is it's good that she was able to get that recognition while yeah. she was still alive. And she's only she only lived about a year till after she got that JR recognition, yeah. right? But she was able to live and see it. Uh, not have been a real shame if she got that posthumously and she yeah. she wasn't able to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think she's a she's certainly one. Um, that a lot of people have probably heard the rumor of the legend of without realizing the details of what it was. A woman who runs away from an abusive father um, who had the ungodly crime of not being a boy. Yep. And what does she do? Ironically, she has to dress up as a boy. She dresses up as a man. And, she, and, and I think she does it because the influence of that book when she was nine years old, she's like, I'm just going to go on an adventure. And she's so independent. And she says she takes some of it from her mother too, which is really awesome. You know, she's in the u.s military intelligence hall of fame she's in the michigan women's hall of fame and she's in the new brunswick hall of fame uh -huh. which is really That's cool she's been recognized by my by my country too um she's definitely a woman whose memoirs i highly encourage everybody to check out they're available just online if you just google the title of it you can find them um yeah i think like all memoirs she embellishes a little bit but I think she's also telling the truth too in a lot of it. Her memoirs are very much like Rufus Dawes that she mm -hmm. describes the horrors of war. Um, you know, she she says things weren't all perfect. Um, she talks about her times as a spy, which are not officially recorded. And you can, and she says often, I'm on an adventure. I love romance, you know. She, well, I think it's I think it's only fair, being the Canadian that she does, for me to raise my Labatt's blue oh in her God. honor. Mary, yeah. To 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 recognize the great Sarah. Edmund. She didn't so, get to see that flag, unfortunately, but we are proud to call her ours. That's true. That is true. So um anyway, well, she died in 1898, right? She did. So so, so she okay. At least she got to see her country. Actually, yeah, she did get to see the country officially formed. Right. She did. She did. She moved out of Texas and all that yep. stuff. So I think this is a good place to drop this off. I think, Mary. I think overall, I think this is a, we talked about two a pair the the, the, the dueling Sarahs, you know, yep. um, both on completely different sides. Absolutely, of the, it's funny know, how that worked out. You have you have one Sarah who is it sounds like a playboy model who has to cover her face and, and she ends up being one of the most notorious type of people to run away with the confederate gold allegedly yeah and then one who um has to come down from canada dress up as a man to fight for the, the country that, that she wants to be her adopted her adopted country yeah um and she ends up getting the recognition and the other one ends up being a complete enigma so anyway so that's a lot of fun so what we're going to do is we're going to do two more okay in two weeks Okay, yeah. just like this. We're going to do a different thing next week. We're going to step back into, um, we're going to talk about some different people next week as well. We might have a special guest next week, Mary, mm -hmm. which we'll keep that under wraps for now. But yeah. I think we're going to be doing another guest. So um, so I think this is a good place to drop this off, I think. I think it's it's fun to do this, especially uh, with recognizing the women of, of History Month and yeah. all that stuff as well. And I think it's um, a lot of these people, uh, there, are, there are hundreds of these people just waiting to be discovered. That, that, that unfortunately you, you, you study the American Civil War, you, you tend to focus a lot on, on, the, on the boys in the middle, you yep. do, right? Oh, uh, we could have and, done a whole episode on Sarah Slater, talked about her for an entire hour and a whole episode on Sarah Edmonds. And I hope in the future we can probably do that, you know, because they mm -hmm. both deserve a full hour, each of them. They do, they do. I bet they would have got along. I bet you they would have. I don't they know why. Would've. Opposites attract, right? Who the hell knows? Anyway, so we'll call it a day here. We'll jump off here. So um, so great job by you, Mary. The research was evidence on this one. It's fun studying one of your, your Canadian peers up there. Um, and uh, it's always fun studying uh, mysterious, you know, mysterious women. It's, get away with it. So it's always a lot of fun. Well, so, you, did all, you did awesome yourself. I was like loved hearing about Sarah Slater and all that you found out about her. And as always, you bring it. And I'm really glad we were able to, you know, kind of give these women a bit more of a voice in history. What's good about Slater is this, she's a situation where there might be some more stuff might pop up five, 10 years from now. That's what's exactly. great about it. Yep. Or never. Or hey, never. that Who Confederate knows? gold's got to be here somewhere in Canada. It might be. It might be. We'll see. We will find out. So, all right, Mary. So again, that was a great, great time. Always talking to you. 
Um, so we will jump off here. So everybody, so live is going to be coming up on Saturday at 10 a.m. as usual. We'll talk about these episodes. We'll talk about some other stuff. Uh, St. Patty's Day is around the corner, Mary. It is. We'll be talking about that. We'll be having a lot of fun with that. Uh, the book club with Lisa Samuel will be coming around the corner as well. So yep. there's a lot of fun stuff coming down the pike. So any last words from you, Fincheroo? Yeah, well, awesome job as always. You're an amazing co-host, amazing person to do this, amazing partner, all that. Um, and actually, just to add on, our next roundtable will not be on the 16th. It will be on the 24th, I think, of March at six o'clock via Zoom. We will be releasing more details about that to follow, but we will probably be doing some trivia. For that right so, around the corner so get your trivia yep. hat ready so everybody thanks for listening we appreciate it have a safe week finish up strong as we head off into the weekend so off we go so good night, everybody have a great weekend and we will talk soon see you guys later <laughs>